okay uh, how was lunch great okay do you have an idea of how big this stage feels <laughs> okay um, so let's get started um, most of us are used to designing in contexts like this for people who maybe look like this who are trying to sell goods and services for people like this. But what happens when we have to design in a context like this for people like this, who may be trying to help people in a situation like this, or this one? So my presentation will be around um, how, how, to, how, how design looks, how design feels in these situations, and how can we um, help designers, uh, sorry, <laughs> um, help res disaster responders to do uh, their job better? How can we uh, leverage them? So I would like to start with a real story. This guy is called Hamish. Um, he works for an organization called Map Action, we, whose mission is to provide valuable geographical information to UN staff during a, an emergency. For example, like the one uh, that happened in Haiti in January 2010. So, before going on with Hamish, a little more context about how a, a disaster uh, looks. Um, when a disaster like Haiti's earthquake happens, uh, certain rescue teams from all over the world deploy to the place. And they offer their help to get people out of rubble. So they are coordinated in, in tents like this by UN staff. The problem they have to, 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 to solve is that they need precise coordinates to, to know where to go so that they can get people out, rescue people. And it's not a minor problem because mo most of these teams come from all over the world and may not know specifically the place where the disaster happened. So if they get the, the precise coordinates, they can go straight to the point. And there are chances of, of getting people out increase. So that was basically uh, what Hamish tried to do when, when he was there. He would receive reports from uh, from people being trapped somewhere, but those reports were re uh, quite um, ambiguous. So uh, they would say something like, hey, I think my uncle was at, I don't know, St. Austin's Hospital when the, the earthquake struck. So he would, he would have to start going from tent to tent in the disaster response camp trying to find someone who may have the, these, these coordinates, who may know someone who knows where the St. Austin Hospital was. So eventually, during once, one of those visits, he met, he, he, he stumbled upon uh, Instead's tent. Instead is where I, I, I work. And as the presenter told you, um, we, we work trying to find innovative solutions to disasters, to, to epidemics, and to, to health issues. So he met, there he met these two guys, Eric, which was, who was um, Instead's CEO at that moment, and Nick, the guy at the left. So they, they, they were the only guys there who had a working internet connection at that moment. Because they, they deployed 
um, just after the, the, the earthquake struck the city, the, the, the country. Um, so they were the only guys who had a, con a working connection and w were willing to share it. When they, they met Hamish, they offered to do the, 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 next, uh, the, the following thing. Um, Hamish would give, give them reports and they would uh, throw them, uh, write them down in a, a, a Skype conference, in a public Skype conference, a chat room. So people from all, all, all over the world who wanted to help started helping Hamish. Um, looking for looking for this um, for these uh, coordinates. So it was a kind of uh, improvised crowdsourcing uh, solution. Um, from then on, Hamish would come to Instead uh, tent um, periodically, and he would bring with him a bunch of papers with new reports, with uh, with new ambiguous reports. Uh, and hand them to Eric, who would, in, 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 in charge, um, give him the, the reports that were geocoded um, from, from the, uh, since, since his, his previous visit. So he would be running from tent to tent anyway. So Nico, Nick and Eric wondered, hey, we can, we can help this guy. What if we let him send reports through SMS to a, to a number we, we provide him and make those messages reach a website automatically uh, where this, these volunteers from all over the world um, may, may, may be able to, to help to geocode. It, it was kind of, okay, um, we have this, this, this workflow which works with Skype and Hamish running from 10 to 10, and now let's, let's try to leverage it and, and make it a bit more um, automatic. And, and well, this, in that way, we can, we can take some uh, weight, we can, we, uh, we can take some work off Hamish's shoulders. So once the, the, the reports were geocoded, uh, he would receive the same message, but this time tagged with uh, the precise coordinates. So then he would go to, to the search and rescue teams with those precise coordinates without having to lose time running through all the camp. So he was so, so happy about this that he even wrote uh, an email to, to his boss in Map Action. And I want to remark this, these words. He said that the, the, the NGO instead provided a sophisticated location search system. So what I've just explained to you doesn't sound that sophisticated, I think. And it wasn't, in fact. We think it was adequate instead. Um, it did succeed at taking some, some, some work off Hamish shoulders. And what's more, more important, it came in time. So that's, that's the, the fundamental concept uh, of, of, of what I want to talk to you about from now on. It's time. It's, it's the scarcest resource in, in this situation, and it's what we have to optimize for. So to gain a, a little more insight about um, how this kind of, con uh, of context is. Um, I would like to just discuss some common, common techniques uh, that usually are quite uh, useful in ex user experience uh, or research, and in this case, may fail. So this is when you start hating me. For example, ethnographic interviews. Um, they are really useful to understand users and their goals. But, sorry, there's no time. Um, and it's not that we, we don't have time. It's that our users we won't have time. They, they, they are trying to save lives out there. So it's, it's a bit... Um, 
it's it's like pretending too much that, uh, if you want to if you want them to sit down with you and give you an interview or maybe of maybe two or three hours so that won't work what actually will work is uh, direct observation you you can gain a lot of insight about how how these guys are, are working by observing them and you you shouldn't become an obstacle or take for example card sorting which lets us organize information and concepts, uh, understand how users organize information and concepts. Um, the problem with this technique is that if you are trying to make something as, com as complex as to need uh, a card sorting exercise, maybe you are not, uh, not in, in the right moment. Um, you should stick to, to something really simple. If you, if you want to have any, any hope of delivering something useful in the time window, you need to deliver it. So again, there's no time. And what about personas? They are wonderful to understand user behaviors. But they, they are a, a very good tool to, to, to make guesses. You know, you, you design your, your persona and then when, when you have um, some doubts on, on the next design decision you have to make, you go to the person and say, hey, would you like if I did this or that? But here you have real, uh, real personas, real people. So those are the, the ones you have to, to focus on. Another thing is that personas let you um, understand the, the different gr groups of users that are going to, to be um, use, uh, using your, uh, your application or your product. And in this case, you have at least, uh, at most, one, two, three people. Um, so speaking of groups, maybe not um, adequate. So again, personas take a lot of research. And research means time, which is scarce. So now, now that you hate me, um, what, what may work? So this is a, this, these are some, some learnings we, we got from our experience. It's, it's not academic uh, research at all. And this is something that's working for us, and this, it's what we, we want to share. So that the first thing is, you have to be there. Um, and at least one member of the team has to be in the very place where things are happening. Uh, there's no, no, no hope that you can make a, a kind of abduction through a Skype call. You have to be there because uh, people there are badly slept. Um, they are eating thin food for weeks. Uh, they are, all, all of them are overworked. So, the only way you, uh, you can understand them is by being there. But it's not enough to be there. You also have to be ready. And by ready, I mean that um, it's not like the usual trip, you know, that you, you, you buy uh, an airplane ticket and then you book a hotel room and you just drop there. The place where you are going is under a humanitarian crisis. So you have to take your own stuff. You have to be self-sustainable for the, for, for the whole time you, you, you are spending there. Um, that means that you have to bring your own food, water, um, electricity generation means, and so on. And if you fail to, to, to do so, you have to be careful. Because disaster responders even have a name for people who go there and prepare and just drop to the uh, response uh, camp. They call them disaster tourists, and they don't like them. So, supposing you're already there, and you're ready, the next question for me is, um, how does the, the design process change from what's usual, from our everyday uh, design project? 
So let, let's go over um, how, how, how the design process looks in, in, in our everyday work. So let's say af after some research, we have some um, high-level goals for, for our product. Um, we start observing reality. We, we start observing the environment. Um, we try to understand how, how people uh, live uh, in, in, the con in, the, in this given context. Um, we, we try to, to, to see how they relate to each other and, and to, the, uh, to the things around them. And after a while, we are confident enough to start designing, which is, well, to combine those, those uh, research we, we have been doing with um, our own experiences at this, uh, as designers and our own skills and try to get the best solution for the problem given the constraints. So, After some time of trying to come up with the best ideas, we are ready to prototype. We start prototyping, and once we, we get the, the first prototype, we put it again in the, in to, to test and under test uh, in the environment. And r then we observe how it changes the reality if it solves the problem we were uh, we were the problems we were trying to solve, and where it brings new problems to the table. And we iterate over and over again this cycle. Eventually, we, f we feel confident enough, or perhaps we are about to run out of budget, and we publish, we ship uh, the, the first version of our product. And depending on the product and, and its success, we start iterating over and over again, uh, uh, exercising this cycle. So. Just as, a, as an example, uh, that, that timeline shows you that perhaps in one month you can have your first release of the product. So how, how does it compare to, to the situation we are discussing now? Okay, it looks like this. Um, the first thing to notice is that uh, the prototype phase is gone and your best effort has to be put in, in that your very first version has to be usable, um, which should be something doable because you are trying to do something really, really simple. Um, then you can go on iterating, but you already have a, um, a version out there. Um, the reason for this is that the search and rescue phase of a disaster response takes at most two or three weeks. After that time, the, 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 the search and rescue phase is called to an end, and no more survivors are searched for. And for every day that goes on, that goes by, your, your chances of get, uh, getting new survivors uh, are decreased. So you have to you have to do your best to, to ship something in one or two days. Another thing to notice is that um, in the previous example, those transitions take days at, in the best, best of cases, um, or, or maybe weeks, or maybe even months. Um, Yesterday, Brian talked about pushing the, the testing um, to, uh, as, to as soon as possible uh, from the beginning of the project. Um, so, I think, I think that's, that, that's, that's the spirit of this, but this is a bit more extreme in, in this case. So now I would I would like to 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 so le let's say you are already there and what do you do what what's the next step how how do you 
how do you do to help someone? Well, find that someone. Identify the, the guy who's, who's needing some, some help from you. And once you identify him or her, it's your, your master. Um, you know that for each stakeholder you take into account when you, design a, uh, when you are trying to design something, uh, the complexity of the solution grows exponentially because of communication, because of uh, the particular desires that each, each person has. So um, just try to, to attach to, to that person uh, you have found, um, make it your master. But then, if you have, um, if you have been able to identify this guy or, or these two or three guys you want to help, um, remember, you, you, you won't have a lot of time to, to talk to them. Because, as I said before, they are under a lot of work. They are really overworked and badly slept. So, um, you will have to be prepared to get as much feedback as possible in, in, a, in a very short amount of time. You have so few opportunities of, of talking to these people, and maybe it will, it will be during a coffee break they take, because when, when they are not out there trying to get someone out of the rubble, they are um, attending some coordination meeting. So a good thing to do is to uh, make a list of, of the most important questions you would like to ask and have it in, in priority order so that um, when you have the chance, you get the most out of it. Otherwise, your only, your only input is uh, direct observation, which is the most important in this case. So, um, the context we are trying to, to design a solution for here is quite um, special. Um, there are lots of things of everyday life that you, you won't get there. You won't, you, you won't find in a, in a disaster response camp. So it's very, it's very important that you feel comfortable with what's out there. Um, I was, when I was um, making this presentation, I, I was uh, thinking of um, displaying uh, a, a, some cuts from Apollo 13. Uh, the, do you remember that scene where they, you know, the, all, all the engineers gather around the table and, and one of them says, okay, we have to, to make uh, this fit into this only using this. And he throws uh, all the context, contents of, of a box on the table. And those things were the things that uh, the astronauts had in, in, inside the ship and nothing else. So, the, the most, the most um, um, common uh, interfaces you can count on uh, and, and that, uh, that you can, um, can, can, can count on responders knowing how to use, sorry for this phrase, it was terrible. Um, it's uh, low-end cell phones, radio, and GPS. Um, any responder, any disaster responder has a GPS device and they know how to use it. They know uh, geography, they know geographic inter, uh, information systems. So that's a very strong background, background uh, you can count on. Um, as regards radio, uh, every responder has one. It's the most reliable communication mean. Um, because uh, it doesn't depend on connections uh, or antennas uh, other than, than the antennas that you can find in, in right in the, the, the devices. But they can become a bit uh, obtrusive when the information you are trying to communicate is not high priority. 
because uh, you know it, it starts making this um, really uh, bothering uh, noises. So for for conveying low priority information, SMS is a very useful way of, of doing that. In general, responders will have low-end cell phones. The reason is that, in general, smartphones are more expensive and they uh, break quite easily. And it's, it's a kind of paradox that the, the most cheap uh, devices, in this case, are the most robust ones. And if, if they break, uh, it's, it's not a problem because it's cheap to replace them. But also, it's a very powerful way of reach outre outreaching for population. 85% of Haitian households have at least one cell phone. So it's 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 a very uh, it's really a, a very powerful way of of reaching for people. Um, for example, uh, during the the response in Haiti, we uh, sent uh, more than one million messages to the population, um, and those messages contain valuable information like, um, please don't go to this hospital because it's full. Go to this other one, or or for example like. Don't, don't drink water without using uh, purifying pills. And then it's paper, the old paper. Um, paper is the most powerful way of sharing information with people who live in the same place as you are living. Um, and I have a personal example of this. So do, do you know what's, what's a loser? I'm 26 year old, and I live with my parents. And well, last week they went on on a trip, and my mother would pin a, a lot of these little, little pieces of paper around the whole house with uh, useful advice for me, like. For example, leave um, all the artifacts and lights turned off before going out, and please behave. The same happens in the, in the coordination tents out there in, in the disaster response camps. Um, here you can see a dashboard which conveys a lot of um, really important information for the, the everyday stuff that they, they have to, to coordinate. Um, so for example, here you, okay. Ah. Um, here you can see the the timeline of, of all the important coordination meetings um, that have to be held every day, so that ev everyone is in the on the same page. There's a lot of people going around the whole camp, and they have to be quite synchronized. And this is the the way they synchronize. And here you can, say, uh, you can see uh, a list of the certain rescue teams available and their capabilities. Or here are some important coordinates of field hospitals. And even it's, it's, it's something that's updatable. So, someone got the, the phone of a guy who's working in the Russian field hospital and just wrote it down. Then everyone else came to know what's, what's, what the phone was. So, if, if you're trying to do something that conveys information, um, it's very important to make it uh, printer-friendly because that's, that's uh, the basic element they use to communicate. Okay, a good, a good example of, of, of interactions with paper and, and systems is uh, walking papers. Uh, any any one of you knows walking papers? Okay. Um, the idea is very simple. Um, a disaster has changed the the way your your place looks. So uh, you want to collaborate with the community and update uh, 
update the maps. So you print a map of, of, of your zone, start walking around, and not, uh, writing down all the relevant uh, information facts you, you, you want to, to write down. Then you come back home, you scan it, and, or maybe take a picture of it, and upload it to, to the walking paper system, uh, which hasn't to be in internet. Uh, it, it can be deployed in a in a private server. So, and then uh, walking papers overlay the the image you got with the map layers, so you can uh, update the information. So it's a very clever way of of letting people um, in a community to uh, update their maps. Um, keep the, their maps up to date, especially when something has changed drastically the, the way the place looks. No water is? Okay. So, when I talk about design in a situation, in, in an emergency situation or a disaster situation, I can't um, ignore the, the implementation part because that's the goal. The goal is to, to have something working um, before it's, it's too late. So I think it's very important to, to, to know how to organize the team so that you, you can get the most out of every, mem every single member. We think that the best way to, to achieve uh, success in these cases is uh, through uh, what we call incremental design. Um, and by this, I mean basically trying to divide your design problem in, a, in, in sm as small pieces as possible so that you can, uh, you can work out each small piece uh, one, one at a time. So when you when you have one one piece already solved, you can give it to the engineer, engineers in your team, and have them start implementing them while you are still uh, still designing. So, for example, um, in this in this case in in the case of of a tool we we, we built for Hamish. Um, we, we, know, we knew from the very beginning that we wanted to interact with him through SMS. So the engineers started immediately to, to implement that, that part of the, of the system. And then uh, the, the, the rest of the team, the designers, uh, would work on, would focus on the, um, on the, on the views for um, the crowd. So a fundamental, a fundamental um, characteristic that the team has to, 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 to have as a skill is fluent communication because uh, you, uh, each, each role in the team has to be validating constantly uh, what the, the other guys are, are doing, uh, what they are doing with the other guys. Um, for example, designers have to ask uh, engineers, what what um, what is feasible in a matter of hours? If they come up with with an uh, an idea that um, may may not be possible to implement in a matter of hours, they have to throw it away. That's a, an additional constraint to to the design. Um, and, the, and and engineers, as they are working with incomplete, non-comprehensive uh, design. They have to make a lot of little design decisions, and from time to time they, they need to validate them. So th this is our take on, on, on how to approach the, the, the team collaboration um, in these cases. So the question that arises to me is, okay, how do we do it? Because uh, it sounds simple, I, I think the ideas are, are quite simple, but um, when you go, when you go to, pra to the practice, it's not that easy to, to make. And, and, and I would like to, to grab 
some examples from jazz. I love jazz, and I think that jazz music is one of the most um, difficult music genres to master. And how do they, they do it? Well, they rehearse for thousands of hours over each music piece until they, they play it perfectly, precisely. So what, what do they do when they go on stage? They play it completely different. E each time they, they go on stage, they play the same song in a different way. They improvise. But the song is still there. You can still uh, tell what song they are playing. And that's because they re respect the, the, the underlying structure. Um, something similar uh, to, to the example that Brian uh, gave us yesterday about uh, Burning Man, um, structure plus chaos. So disaster responders do the very, the, the very same thing. While they are not uh, responding to a real disaster, they are simulating one. They gather at some place and they exercise their protocols. That way they are ready to, to, to respond effectively once the, the real situation happens. But they also have to improvise because each disaster is unique and brings its unique challenges. So if both just musicians and disaster resp responders, who are the people we are trying to help, practice a lot, why wouldn't we do the same thing? And how can we how can we exercise uh, this? How can we simulate the situation uh, in in our themes? Uh, a good way of doing so is um, just agree on on a on an, an everyday problem with the whole team and start working at ni 9 a.m. and do not stop working until 22 at, at until 10 p.m. So the only condition is that you have to get something working by the end of that time. And, and something that helps makes, makes uh, the situation better from uh, when you started com compared to when you, when you finished. And that has to be usable and has to be public. Anyone has to, to be able to use it. So in doing these this exercises, uh, that quote is quite little, but it says, catastrophic or otherwise extreme events often bear the fruit of new ideas, which is something that Anders Ramsey said. So when, when we started doing these this exercises, these simulations, um, we began to notice that there were some, some values that we wanted to to apply in, in the non so uh, urgent projects in the in the every in our everyday design not not this this special kind of of design um, and so we started trying trying to to make a, a workshop of, of this one extreme day to 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 get a, a first a very first per version of, of a new project and we noticed that, well, these ex extreme constraints, we are really good ideas. It seems that when we are under a lot of pressure, a lot of awesome things happen. I don't know if, if, if it's something that our brains are prepared for. Uh, we should ask neurologists or psychologists, but that, that's what we, what, what, we get, what we get. We also found out that uh, the experience is, is very exciting for the whole team. Um, so I, I think that you know that two, two, two fundamental components of, of entering flow state is are um, having clear goals and being focused. And the fact that you have to you have 20 hours to get something working that's that's very simple. That's um, that's something very well bounded, uh, I think it, it helps to, to, to arrive to, to those, those two conditions. And 
Another interesting effect we, we notice is that uh, there's a kind of feature Darwinism in, in, in the fact that you, you have a, a really constrained deadline and you have to get something working by, by, the, by that deadline. So each feature has to fight really hard against the other ones to get to the implementation uh, to the, and to the design phases. So I think all this together can, can be a, a, a fruitful exercise to, to, to get the fundamental product essence by, by the end of one day. Um, so it, it's, it's a, very, a, a very fast way, a very um, easy way of um, getting to understand what defines the product we are trying to do in, in, in a very short amount of time. And, and it's a kind of, you, you got the whole team and they are Im really immersed in, in the project in, in just a few hours. And then you continue normally. Okay, um, to sum up a bit, um, we think that designers and design thinking are really needed in these in this emergency situations. But we also recognize that designers have to, um, have to adapt to, to, this, uh, to these particular situations. The, the, process, the, the, the use, usual processes change, change a lot. Um, so there's a need for adaptation. And Brian, yesterday, sorry I'm uh, making so, so, much, so many references to you, but um, he <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's over here. Um, he talked about impact by the end of his talk. Um, he, he said that there were some people that um, were really interested in the impact of, of what they, they were doing. So um, I would like to, to end with, uh, with, with a question regarding impact. What do you think is the impact of doing something that in any way can help to save just one life. Thank you. <laughs>